part of the languages of the timer of timer series, and I will speak about some Yiddish languages today. So this is the yesterday map of all languages, uh, and today we will speak about the eastern, northern, eastern, northern, western, sorry, part of them. So the summer Yiddish languages are Tundra Yiddish, Tundra Yiddish, Forest Yiddish, and Danasan. And tomorrow we will speak about Dolga and Abenki, which are not northern Semi and which are not directly related to each other either. Just make for example, because they remain us. Uh, Summer Yiddish languages. Um, they belong to Uralic languages, and all Uralic languages are divided into Fennegu, Greek, and Summer Yiddish. So Fennegu Greek is a huge branch with uh, many, many languages and Samo Yedik is a quite a small um, group of, uh, here we have uh, five languages for Northern Samo and then there are a maximum of five other languages and that's all. Uh, and then in the Samo Yedik languages are divided, uh, sometimes divided into Southern and Northern and um, so definitely not as many languages exist as a group and uh, the other Sumerian languages may be grouped or may not be grouped but it doesn't really matter for today um, and all the Sumerian languages are actually the whole list is here this is forest nanets, tundra nanets, yura which is extinct, anets, forest and tundra and ganasan and all of them except forest nanets are spoken in Taiwan Forest, forest nenets is a um, close relative to tundra nenets and it's uh, open to the southwest of Timor. And I will not speak about it today. So, what, it, what will be in today? First, I will present some basic sociolinguistic information about these languages, just to know what are the numbers of speakers, how well they are preserved uh, today. Then, uh, no, it's not brief. <laughs> uh, it's an overview of structural profile of, the, of these languages. This will be the main part of, um, of the today's, um, my today's talk. And then I will speak a little bit about non-Semitic as a linguistic family. Uh, you know, what is its relationship to other Semitic languages and what is their internal relationship. So, basic sociolinguistic facts. Uh, so for the rest of today, I will speak about these four languages, Tundra Nenets, Nanasan, Forest Tenets, and Tundra Enets. And um, already is in this table, Forest Enets and Tundra Enets will be lumped together quite often. If we speak about ethnic um, group, the size of ethnic people who count themselves ethnically Tundra Nenets, then if we follow the last, the last sem all Russian census of 2010, there are about 3,000 people um, for Tundra Nenets, there are about 740 people for Ganasan, and there are about 180 people for Enets. And um, uh, in Russian, they are both called Enets without the differentiation, so we don't have separate numbers. And this is from left to right, you see the, the kind of the healthier language to the left, and the more marabond languages are more to the right. Then we have the numbers of speakers from the same number, from the same census, which is not very different from expert estimates by myself, by my colleagues working with these languages. So we have about 1,800 of speakers of Tundra Nenets, and this is the number of Tundra Nenet speakers for Taiwan only. Ganasan, Forest Nenets, and Tundra Nenets are spoken by me in the Tamar Peninsula, but Tundra Nenets is spoken in the um, Siberian North and European North, but basically in the north of Russia, west of Timor, and then num the numbers of speakers may go up to 50,000 maybe, uh, so uh, maybe 20 or 30, so but much bigger than this. This is really the number only for Tamar and Tundra Nenets. Then from Ghana South we have about 50 speakers and then for Forest Edits we have about 20 speakers and for Tundra Edits we have about 15 speakers. So it's really quite different numbers. Uh, here we, I count only full speakers 
but uh, especially for Ghana-san and the ANC languages, you clearly understand that at this stage of endangerment there, are, there is quite a fuzzy area and quite uh, many people who kind of may maybe understand but not speak or may understand but will not tell you that they understand because they are kind of ashamed that Maybe they are ashamed that they do not know the language, and that's why they would prefer to neglect the ability to speak it all together. Or maybe they uh, just want to be more, see themselves as more civilized and as a global population, and they don't want to be the language. So there are, there are a couple of dozens at least, or even more, of kind of semi speakers, half speakers. Remembrance, uh, but these are the numbers for really full speakers who can speak this language, who can converse, who can produce text. And then we have the locations in the last row, and this is also quite important. Uh, for so Tundrinians live in about 10 villages in Thailand, and mainly they live in Tundra with reindeer. So um, they do practice reindeer husbandry today. And uh, that's why the language is quite alive. Then from Ganasan we have four villages with different levels of um, language endangerment. Then for forest annex we have one village. And then for Tundra annex we have one village and we also have some people living in Tundra with Tundra native speakers. So basically there are these 15 speakers but they are all very scattered. So they do not stay in one village. And so if you compare like it to 20 speakers who are in one, one village here, the situation is even worse. And also these are the numbers beyond the town of Dudinka. Dudinka is a local town and uh, you have it on a map over here in the very south of Timor. And of course many people speaking these languages live today um, in town. Uh, Okay, what are the age of speakers for Tundra Nyanets? We have all ages because, as I said, the language is used in Tundra and so that's why there are children speaking it who were born in Tundra and live in Tundra and they don't speak. Um, maybe some of them will speak some Russian before going to school but they may also go quite well without Russian before they go to school. Um, then from Ganasan, it's, um, there is hardly anyone younger than 15, who would be a good speaker of the language. And for forest edits and to edit the age, the age limit is about 60, so even worse. And about language use. So, tundra dance is actively used in the tundra, in the families and reindeer husbandry, like, so, in numerous everyday activities. And this is not the case for the other assimilated languages of Timur. Uh, so, basically, Ghana Sun Forest Enids and Tundra Enids are used only for cultural self identification. So, when there is no uh, practical need in speaking these languages because all, everyone speaks Russian, and it's only when people want to underline that they, they belong to one culture, when they want to enjoy their, their long, um, the, the fact that they belong to the Anians or the Nganasans, they would speak this language. And it happens not very often for Nganasan and even rare, more rarely for forest Anians and very rarely for Tundra Anians. And basically, uh, this also uh, reflects the numbers of speakers in one place. So it's not that uh, the Nganasans need, have a, a, more, a more, urgent, more urgent need for cultural self-identification, but that there are just more of them, and so it's more often that an Amazon speaker can meet an Amazon speaker, mm -hmm. and it's less often so for forest edits, and even less often so for tundra edits. And then two words about schooling. So there are lessons of tundra edits in schools um, and of Nganasan, and though such a help as language use in the family, but still it's kind of also important um, emblematic fact for, for, for local people, like which languages are visible in the system of education, which are not. Forest and it used to have some school
school um, lessons in school in, the, in this only village of Potapova where they live, uh, but it has taught for at least 10 years. And Tutra Enets has never been taught in schools and has never been visible in public domain. And then there are these language nests um, which were open after the Sami model, and then like it was Sami model for, for Timer, but in Sami it built after the New Zealand model. It's one kind of kindergarten groups which would have a teacher speaking the native language. And it's not clear how how many hours a day these teachers will speak, but this program was established for Forest Pines and for Tanasan. And then Forest Pines, likely they were indeed some of the end speakers, forest end speakers of the village were indeed kindergarten teachers, so kind of it was very easy to set up the program. But it stopped a couple of years ago because there was a fire in the building, and so there was no more building, so it was a very practical matter why it stopped. Maybe it will be resumed, maybe not. And again, two granites was never even mm, was never ever considered to be appropriate for this kind of pro program because their tundra enets are very scattered. And there is not a single place which can be called. This is the tundra enets place, and that's why in this school in this place we need to have tundra enets lessons. Okay, that was all for sociolinguistic facts. Do you have any questions to this part? Because now I will come to structures. Uh, so these lessons are held in Nagantan, for example, or no, no, no that is a question. Yeah, and they, they, they used the books which were written for students speaking these languages as native languages. Mm -hmm. But quite often the school children will not speak, will 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 come to school with no and uh, with, without being able to say uh, any sentence in Ghanaian or for those children and who who live in towns or sometimes in some villages, they also do not speak Tungvenianets anymore. And then, so they come to school and they will have these lessons in Russian using books which were designed for the speakers of this language. So it's quite messy. So it's more about emblematic values. So you know, the parents really like that their children have these um, lessons. And uh, yeah, but it's not of very big use. Well, it, it's again, it's of use for those people, for those children who do not speak any Ingarasana or any Tundranians, and then they know some words, they can count, so they can, they acquire some kind of affiliation with the, the heritage language. Yeah, but it's not about speaking about it. What about the language and Of 
Nunez uh, were taken from, originate from this book. Um, then for Enet, Enet is a language that I've been working on with Andrei Stuinsky for quite many years. We have a big corpus in the draft of grammar. And uh, we have recently um, written a sketch grammar of uh, maybe 40 pages um, for Europe languages. And this is very concise, and I also use a lot of examples from my book that was quite well selected, and I'd like to share it with you if you want. I'm going to sound, I shall thank Beate for sharing with me a draft of the grammar, the grammar of Nganasan, which is as big or the bigger than this Tundranian uh, frame and will be out very soon. Uh, and then for Yurak, um, we have the only word list uh, collected in the 1918th century and analyzed by Jan Hilinski, and he wrote a small paper five pages uh, about this language and uh, providing uh, some he, he so we have this word list that he has used fully reproduced in this paper and also some comments to it uh, but i will not refer much to the URAC it's more about the phonetic reconstruction because it's just one list okay um, i have worked with Annette and um, a lot. I have some uh, field, field uh, experience with children and it's in Ghana some, but in a much more limited extent. So I hope I will be right. And then correct me if I'm wrong for Ghana some. And no one will correct me if I'm wrong for Enet. Um, okay, the phonology. This is a vowel system for Enet, for Ghana some, and for children and it. I start with this one. But they are pretty similar, I shall say. So maybe the Enet system is the simplest. Uh, basically, you have one, two, three, four, five, six languages in both data, in both um, data to Enet, and there is this open air, which is the only forest, not in Tundra. Uh, so this is quite simple model in inventory, uh, but importantly, it has quite many allophones, uh, the, the vowels. Um, so in phonetics it's not as simple as in phonology. Then if we compare it with Nganasa, we see that the main, the main difference with Enet is the existence of the position between unrounded and rounded vowels. So if Enet would have only E, this one would have E and U. <coughs> but again, not on all levels. And if you compare it with Tundran Enet, um, then we see here the position between long and short vowels. Uh, most probably, it's really a descriptive decision that um, in Yamasan and in Enix, we also have the long vowels and short vowels, but we analyze them as, as a consequence of two identical vowel themes, and in Tundra they do not. Uh, but there are some smaller phonological reasons why the Analyze these two phonemes here and this one long phoneme here, mm, but historically we sound quite the same. And then kind of this the system of short vowels is quite similar to the Enet ones. And then the Tundra Enet is famous for having an overshot and even a reduced vowel. Reduced it means that um, it is their phonology, and in some uh, context, depending on the number of syllables um, and of the order of the syllable. It will be realized as an overshot, and sometimes it will be realized by zero. And, oh, is the uh, schwa really low? You mean, or can it be realized as a mid vowel? Yes. Well, this is phonology, uh, and not phonetics. That's, that's what I've, I've given the phonetic parents here for Enet, and I will. You know, yeah, I will tell you later, I will say this explicitly, that these languages are quite notorious for being phonetically, the phonetic transcription will, will always be quite different from the phonological transcription, as if it were a European language with an old history of writing, but it is not. So basically, to arrive to these quite simple phonologies, you need to to, uh, to make some analysis. So when you listen to it, phonetically they sound much more diverse. Uh, and the same for consonants. Um, 
consequence system are even more similar. So basically, this is this, the, this is my chart for anions, but the Gamma-Sign consonantal system is exactly the same. So it is a bit different, different phonetically, uh, but except maybe for per, um, all the other consonantal phonemes are the same. So again, you can check the the allophones, the phonetic realizations, if you want. And important, um, interesting thing is that they have interdentals spellings, and they're usually most often realized as interdentals, not as um, um, dentals. Uh, what else? They have a glottal stop, which kind of is also quite peculiar for the area. Um, yeah, and then they have the here in two planets there are more consonants, but basically the difference besides the bilateral work is that there are more palatalized, phonologically palatalized consonants in two planets. So here, like burp for anet and ganasa, burp, ma, wood or r, or yeah, or z, they would not have palatal errors. Others like the d, the ch, which is ultimately t. Na, nya, la, le, and s and sh, this sh is used to be s. So, there, there some, um, they say the uh, palatalization distinction was for, uh, uh, became a part of phonology for Ayat and Ganasa and for even more consonants for Tundrinet. But for example, no, even Tundrinet does not make a distinction in palatalization. Okay, now some more general words uh, beyond the inventories. Uh, for consonants, there are many phonotactic restrictions. So uh, it is not the case that all consonants can be tested anywhere in the syllable or in the world. In the word. Uh, then, as I mentioned, there are in Anit and Ganasan there are these long or double vowels as opposed to short vowels, and basically these are phonologically are better analyzed as there were two vowels in a row. And then Ganasa, some sort of the spirit also has diphthongs, but uh, not anything and not nenets. Then Ganasa is also famous for its constant gradation, which, de um, which kind of, it's a change in consonants uh, depending on the number of syllables um, in the word uh, and whether it's a not syllable or a living syllable and whether the syllable is closed or open. So basically when you, um, this is especially visible in affixes, so if you add an affix to what is one syllable or three syllables, you have a different view uh, form of this affix, uh, uh, unlike if you add it to a word with two or four syllables. So kind of you need to count syllables all the time. And it's a very complicated matter, and I'm not a specialist in Ghana Sans, so I'm not going into more details here. It is kind of um, important thing to mention is that it is related, it has the common origin with um, uh, with um, kind of weak and strong uh, consonants in Finnish and Sami languages. But in the Samoyedic family, only Ganasan has kept it. Um, okay, uh, importantly, almost all underived lexical morphemes would be more mono or vice versa. So the words without inflection and duration, the words are usually short. Um, then, and it has a very simple uh, a syllable structure. So basically, there are only CV or B. Um, uh, syllables, so you cannot have a consonant, you cannot have a closed syllable, and you cannot have a consonant cluster. Uh, this was, this is still in phonology, but phonetically, the last generation of speakers, those who kind of basically stopped using the language, they have a lot of vowel reduction, phonetic vowel reduction. That's why you see, you hear a lot of closed syllable, a lot of consonant clusters. Uh, but uh, the idea is that even in the 1970s, this kind of um, reduced pronunciation or allegro pronunciation, as Evgeny Plinsky called it, uh, was not uh, typical. 
So this is really a recent fact about the phonetics and not about the phonology of the language. And phonologically, this is really very consonant vowel, consonant vowel, consonant vowel, simple structure. Uh, Tumbrinian and Tengenasan are a bit more complicated because they allow a consonant at the end of a syllable, um, but they also do not allow onset consonant clusters. Then there is an issue of stress, which is a very complicated and under-researched matter in Northern Samaritan languages. Not because no one was interested in it, but because it's really complicated. And uh, simple tests and simple uh, studies do not give any results. Still, even for all of these languages, it's not entirely clear whether the stress is on what level, on phrase level. What is visible is that you would all, almost always have um, a prominent syllable, but this is kind of um, physiologically conditioned. And in an anets and tundrin anets, usually the first syllable will be the most prominent prosodically, like the longest to the most intensive. Um, but this is not necessarily always so. And in Ganasan, the most prominent syllable would be the penultimate. But since uh, many words are of two syllables, it gives you the same result. The same result as in anets and tundrin anets. Um, and then this last point that the phonetic transcriptions are usually quite far from phonological ones, so that uh, you really need, um, you as a linguist, need some time to analyze the, the, this kind of pronunciations in order to arrive to phonological transcription. And on the contrary, when you see what in the dictionary and you hear how this one is pronounced, you will be kind of struck how, why is it so different? Um, okay, and then there is a lot of variation on different levels, and I show you examples from planets. So first, there is quite a lot of phonetic variation. For example, it's zero realization of many things. For example, global stop can often be realized by zero. So this is the word for bedding, like traditional bedding in a tent, and it is ba'a, so it has the integral of into the mechanical glottal stop, and it can be realized like this. You can have some optional glottalization of vowels, or you can lose this segment, the consonant segment, and have just glottalization, or you can lose glottalization altogether. So, and it is very common. And um, can, if you ask a person to repeat a word, they can repeat you immediately with all these different variants. So they do not. Um, make the difference between them the, uh, themselves. Then what final vowels? As I told you, there are no closed syllable, but in, pra in practice, what um, final vowels are very often lost. Like this is the word for sledge, odo, and it can be, it can lose its final vowel, and then it, it can also, the last consonant can become devoiced. You will see some examples on the next slide. Uh, and it's uh, like this is another, another example of the word for this cheek here, which can become cheek or cheek. Then the second vowel is the sequence of the two identical vowels, or like in other words, long vowels can be pronounced as short vowels. This is the word for who, which is, has double a, and it can be realized with just single a. And this is the word for what. And again, uh, it can be realized uh, as a short vowel, piece of without the bottom stop. Then if you have a polysyllable word, and if you have affixes, you will have most of the polysyllable words, then even vowels can be omitted. So like this is um, the word for dog in forest and it um, would be bunaki, but quite often it is either bunik or bunki, depends on whether there is further inflection. And uh, also, a vowel can be lost before a glottal stop in what final affixes. Like, um, this is the set affix zop for first person singular. So, I will work, yazo dazo, this is the glossing, yazo dazo, but it can be pronounced as a yazo dazo. So, without, with the loss of this final vowel and the retention of the glottal stop, or with the loss both of the final vowel and the glottal stop. Um, and this is a single example from Tundra and from Forest. Um, okay, and now there are some sounds. Let's see how you see it. You hear them. So this, I will uh, give you to listen to the word for forest, and it's this sledge. 
is one speaker which pronounced just sledge, and the other speaker will pronounce the word for, um, it's not just sledge, but old sledge, say how they call it. And then uh, you will hear two, you know, one other speaker from Tundra Edits pronouncing the word for mosquito, again emitting the final vowel. Okay, this was pronounced in a row, so the question was please say sledge, and uh, that's how they pronounce. One and the same. Huh? One and the same speaker. One and the same speaker, this is just the same recorded, it's not synthesized, so kind of. Could you say sledge several times? And they would say hot or caught. Uh, so they do not uh, think that they pronounce it different words. This is the other speaker. Okay, and this is the word for mosquito. Okay, I will switch. I will switch it on again. So the first the speaker pronounces it with the with the vowel at the end, and the linguist asks to repeat it three times, and then they repeat it without the vowel. Correct me. 
or like there are many words with Z and you cannot use scissor and there are many whole pairs for S and Z. So uh -huh. this is, there is a definitely phonemic contrast between S and Z. But for some words, like a couple of dozens, you have two variants. So it's, and there is no um, sociology, um, no social situation. or gender or whatever bias toward, um, in this variation. So I have not counted the frequencies. It may be the case that some people prefer one variant over the other, but they definitely all speakers can produce both variants. And uh, quite often they can produce them together. Like when you ask what is the word for need, they will tell you also or also. You can, you can use it, you can say it how you want. Uh, sometimes they kind of know not in this, if they're kind of more linguistically talented and more attentive, sometimes they do not. Yeah. Um, there was a, there is an idea in the linguistic literature that kind of small societies and can have more of this kind of variation than bigger languages when you have more unified structures. And um, there are several works by Nancy Dorian who has suggested that this kind of, un it must not only be a small society but also very homogeneous socially and then you will have this, um, uh, may have this variation. She studied Scottish Gaelic and also there were a lot of variants in, in the speech that she has studied. Um, I know, well, I've done this specific uh, phonetic and phonological research into Enneads, not into other Nganasan or Tundran Enneads, but as far as my colleagues studied in Nganasan, um, listen to this data, they often say, yeah, it looks quite the same in Nganasan, so kind of no one has tried to study and to, to, use, to kind of um, to, uh, learn precisely whether all speakers can pronounce all the variants. But generally, it seems very quite uh, similar to the Afghanistan phonetics. Okay, now we go to morphology. First, an overview of the stem structure. This is uh, the overview is based on anets, but the general system is the same in Tundra Nenets and Afghanistan. It's a bit more complicated. You know, this basic system is further complicated by consonant gradation in Ganasa, but the, this principle remained true. And basically, the the system was like this in Proto-Semitic, in yes, in proto and definitely in proto Um So this is from inflectional classes uh, of dividing all verbal and nominal stems into classes in the same for nouns and verbs, and basically. Speaking very roughly, there is a, a big inflectional class with majority of nouns and verbs, which would be kind of a default model. Well, I call it default, and some other colleagues would call it like um, vowel final stems. But it doesn't really matter. The important thing is that the majority of nouns and verbs are pretty regular and have few stem affinations. And then there is a, another class of um, verbs and nouns which contain quite limited, quite limited number of nouns and verbs, but they're very frequent usually, and they have substantial stem alternations. So kind of, uh, you have a neat class with many verbs, and you have a small class with few verbs, but with quite uh, many stems and a more complicated system. How these classes of stems are defined? They're defined by the allomorphs of alternating suffixes, and I'll show you an example. It's to see an example. So this is a word for um, tent. These are all examples from Enets now. If it's T, it's Tundra Enets. So these are all examples from Tundra Enets. This is a word for tent, the word for person, and the word for language. And this is the nominative form. And you do not see any, you cannot um, see any distinction in classes. But if you look at the locative form, you see that the locative affix looks differently for this word, for this word, and for this word. And always the difference will be in the initial consonant of the, of the affix. And basically, by this outlook of the affixes, we divide all the um, verbs or all nouns into classes. And these uh, examples also show you, this is the 
what belonging to the kind of this default class, so more regular class. And these are two words, tant and first who belong to these alternating classes, which means that, uh, that this default one is one and the same stem for the word, this is language, it's now in nominative. If you make it plural, you just add an agglutinatively, agglutinatively add a suffix of plural, but the stem is the same. And then if you add locative, the stem is again the same. So this is the regular class with most nouns and verbs. But here, the nominative would be miek. But if you want to make a plural out of it, you would need to use a different stem, which would be mezo. And if you want to make a locative, it wouldn't be mek kone. But then the glottal stop will disappear and you'll have it like kind of three stems here. And this sorry, is sorry, and what if I want to make a plural locative? Will it be meza or me? A plural locative would be me to me. Okay, so meza is only for the direct plural stem. And not only, I mean, you will see the number of the set of forms which okay. give you the stem in a minute. Um, yeah, and you see here that it's uh, this is one subtype of alternative verbs, and this is another subtype of alternating nouns. Because like the, the nominative stem would be ending in a global stop in both cases, but this stem for plural would you would need to add like zo here, but o here. So it would be enche but encho. And then they you would get the stem to be used with the locative in both cases by omitting the global stop from the nominative stem. So these two words show you a more complicated class, which has its own subclasses, and there are more than two subclasses to it. These are just for example. And this is an example of a simple word from a regular class. Uh, yeah, so yes, there, these inflectional classes, both for nouns and verbs, are defined by the allomorphs, and the allomorphs, the most important thing is the initial consonant. Mm, okay. So, and the, this uh, default class, the main class, the most regular one, it has just two stems, the basic stem and the plural possessive stem. And this is what it says. So this another stem would be used only in plural possessive forms and nowhere else. So if you take like for example a word for fishing net, it would be uga, and the uga is I at the end, and if you want to say our fishing nets, then you would say poguna. And Usually it is a change in the last vowel, and in most cases it is predictable. Uh, so it's um, quite a big distinction. But then if you take the nouns of these alternating classes, they would have three stems that we have seen. Basic, which was in the second um, column, nominative, and so-called mediate. That's how we call them in the description of edits. But um, these three stems would be there both for um, for Tunisians and Ghana as well. So if we look at this now nouns of the alternating classes, then the nominative stem would be used for the least number of forms, like non-possessive nominative and then a couple of other forms. And the basic stem would be used for a bit more number of forms. And then the reduced terms will be used for all other nominal forms, and this will be like a couple of dozens of forms. So the reduced terms is the most frequent, actually, if you look at texts. Um, and the basic stem is the least frequent, and nominative stem is usually used for subjects, but also for some other occasional things. Um, okay, that was uh, the system for nouns, for verbs. Again, the verbs of the default class, of the regular class, would have just two stems. And again, it is just what it says. It will be basic and or aorist imperative stem. Which means that in aorist and in imperative, it would use a different stem. But in all other forms, it would use one and the same form. But the verbs of the alternating class would have more stems. It's four in Tundra Enids and six in Forest Enids. And, um, some other numbers for children and and son. So this is really um, uh, a you know, much more messy area of, um, of the system. Yeah, I have a stupid question. Uh, we show real slide. Yeah. What has a phenomenal stats of the Google with the aorist? So this is about nouns. Yes. Ah, I, I see your question. Um, this is uh, about predicative forms, 
like I'm a woman. Um, if you have a non-possessed third person, not I, but he is a man, and this is in our rest, or in the past, you would use this form. But if it is um, third person plural, our rest, for example, they are men, you would use a different form. But basically, it, it comes because man is one stamp and man in plural is a different stamp, so that's why here uh, the difference will be also the same. Okay, that was the stamp, so now you add the morphology to the stamps. Um, if you speak about nouns, I'll show you examples uh, on the next slide. But basically, what are the grammatical categories? We have case, noun, and possessor. And for the possessor, it's the person of the possessor and the number of the possessor, which is not. Um, then we have this um, destinative or designated or benefactive forms. And this category is uh, independent of either case, number, or possessor. Then there are cases. And there is, um, formally, there is a distinction between core or grammatical cases and local cases. Um, and the core cases are nominative and oblique, like in uh, Enets, there are only two core cases, nominative and oblique. But in Tupren Enets and Ghana, there are three core cases, nominative, accusative, and genitive. And then the locative cases, local cases, are all these other four other ones, dative, or lative, ablative, or essive, locative, and prolative. And this, um, all of the Semitic languages have this same number of cases. So their case systems are really very similar. Then in also all these uh, non Semitic languages, you have kind of forms, which are quasi cases, commutative, correlative, and translative. They're quasi cases in the sense that they cannot be attached to other cases and uh, cannot be combined together with other cases, but they are less frequent and have more restrictions on their uh, morphology. And why the, the main reason why we distinguish between core cases and local cases is that if you want to build um, if you want to build build a possessive not a good example um, if you want to build a possessive form so if you want to say my house or in my house if you want to say my house then um, and the possessor is always expressed together with case and number in one affix. So you would have house and then you would have an affix for my. But if you want to say in my house, you would have a house, affix for locative, and then you would have an affix for my, which will be an oblique case marking. So if either you say it's double case marking or you say this are two different categories. And here are the examples from Ganasan. So this is the word for tent. If you remember, it was me in Tundra Enes, and it's ma here, which is quite uh, similar. Okay, so if you want to say use a locative, then you just add a locative prefix to the correct stem, of course. Then look, you want to say um, you want to use uh, a, a locative case marker with a possessor to say like in his stand, then you would need to use a, a, a locative marker, which will be different in possessive forms and from plain forms. And after that, you would use a possessive marker, which is simultaneously a case, a core case marker. You can compare in his stand to in his stands, and you see that the possessive marker is the same, the stem is the same, it's only the case marker which will be different. So this uh, um, these case markers will have one form for uh, singular and one form for plural. For comparison, here you have my tent with a different possessive. Um, you have two tents uh, with just a um, number marking. And my two tents, so you see this is a word for tent, this is dual, and this is possessive. And this is accusative form. And it's again different from just plain. Uh, okay, okay, it was also accusative. So it is different because it, it goes after a locative case. And th this is the, this um, interesting category of destinative. The Nordic-Semitic languages are famous for this category because it's only Nordic-Semitic languages in the whole Siberia that have it. 
and they all have it, and it's quite a uh, rare technology thing. Uh, to loosely languages, Evan and Evanity have a category which looks quite similar, not exactly the same, but quite similar, and uh, this is quite um, probably there is this um, contact influence because nowhere else in Siberia would have this kind of thing. So what is it? It is a marker which goes after derivation and before um, before possessives and it means for someone like I will tell you a tale this is a verb, I will tell this is a tale, like I will tell you a small tale and uh, basically if you translate just this word it is a, t a tale for you and this oblique case marking shows that it is not in the subject position okay. uh, so you have this Definitive marking, and then you have a possessive marking showing to whom it is uh, um, designed. Uh, and then you can have um, syntactically these distinctive forms can be used in subject position. Uh, well, this was an example for an object position. This is an example for subject position. Is there a gift for him? So there is a verb, there is. Um, and then this, this is its subject. And it's a, um, a gift, and this is a loan from Russian, uh, with a distinctive marker and with a possessive marker. Mm, so it has three synthetic positions, but it, is, it can be used as subjects, as objects, and also as a, um, it's called translative adjunct. Basically, it is a very specific function, something used as something. I'll show you the example. They used it as a shop. So you have a verb, meaning used, and you have a, a sub, an object cross-reference in the verb. So it shows, this object cross-reference shows that it has um, a zero uh, object of third person singular. So they used it, basically this is verb form says. And then you have, they used it how? As a shop. Um, so it, you would have this kind of structure if your verb is either inflected for object or you have a separate object. So you can have they use this tent as a shop and then this tent would be direct object and this would be this adjunct. Um, yeah, and the edit, as I told you, has only two core cases, nominative and oblique. And basically it means that in subject position always nominative markers are used in this adjunct position, always oblique markers are used. And for direct objects, you can have foes. And it depends, uh, um, it has a very neat distinction in forest edits, that it depends on whether it's um, uh, same subject or different subject. If, it's, if it is something for the subject of the clause, you would have it marked one way, and if it's there's something designed for not for the subject of the clause, you would have to mark um, differently. But this is a very minor distinction and it is not repeated in contra -enance. There are, as you see, as I show you, morphology of um, and of the syntax of tundra and forest enids are very similar. And this is here and there you can find some small distinctions. And for example, this distinction between the same subject distinctive and different subject distinctive is found only in forest elements, but not in tundra elements. Okay, now verbal morphology, very briefly. So basically after the verb you have some derivation, uh, and then you have a tense or marker, and then you have a person marker. Uh, and the person marker will have, will be of one of these three series, as a subject, from the subject series, from the subject object series or from the so called medial series. It means that if you have an intransitive clause, then your verb will be marked either with the subject paradigm or with the medial paradigm. And speaking very roughly, this is lexically defined. So some verbs will take subject paradigm and some verbs will take the medial paradigm. And uh, there is a fuzzy area because there are few verbs that can take both paradigms and have some spectral distinction. Um, and then if you take a transitive clause, its verb can be either in the subject paradigm or in the subject object paradigm. And basically you 
would use a subject-object paradigm if the object is, is a discourse level topic. And this, as far as I know, uh, the, this is definitely the case for Tundra Nyanets and for Anets because um, uh, there have been specific studies devoted to this issue when subject-object um, cross-reference markers would be used. For the Ghana Sun, as far as I know, there has not been such a specific study, but the general feeling is that it's also connected to the discourse properties of the object. Um, this, is this is true for NNs and for Tundra NNs. Um, they are very similar. They're the same in this. Uh, um, this. Yeah, am I right that uh, it looks like it's similar in Ghana Sun, but nobody has yeah. precisely studied it? Okay. Then, an in, uh, interesting thing for those uh, who are uh, outside the domain of the Russian language is that Enets also has a Slavic style mm -hmm. aspect. Then, the reason and marked tense mood uh, form, which is called aorist, uh, and its present or past value depends on the aspect of the verb. And here are the examples, and this is exactly the same in all non Semitic languages. Do you want to ask a question now? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, mm, sorry, um, this is maybe a bit not on point, but uh, I think uh, I read a paper recently by Hilipsky about that the uh, Slavic uh, like uh, quality of the semantic aspect uh, should be abandoned as a discursive concept. I don't remember his arguments, but uh, um, if you have anything to say about that. No, it's it's uh, it's not that I insist that it is a that there is such a thing as Slavic style aspect and it is exactly what it is in Northern Semitic languages. It is just to help you understand how it works. No, it is not exactly the same and if you are interested there is a, um, my colleague for this eight slides and page but it's has recently written specifically a paper devoted to an aspect and how it is different from Russian aspect. So, so basically, if you take a perfective verb like put, whom, examples from Enets, from Forest Enets, and you have no tense marker, this is just cross reference markers, uh, he put them into a dish, you would get a past interpretation. If you take an imperfective verb, feel sorry for this, and um, you use exactly the same cross reference markers, and you would get a translation in present. It also feels sorry for its children. And uh, all verbs are either perfective or imperfective. And the perfective verbs will give you, without any tense mood markers, past reading. And imperfective verbs will give you present reading without any tense aspect markers. Um, then there are numerous non final verb forms, as all over Siberia. And then uh, there is a negative Negation of verbs is made by using a specific negative verb and a specific non-finite verb, which is called connective. So this negative verb will take all the inflection, person, number, tense, mood, and this will always be the same, um, which is non-finite form. Okay, that was verb, and then a couple of words about other parts of speech. Uh, pronouns. Personal pronouns are separate, but all the other pronouns and numerals have standard normal inflection. Personal pronouns are also interesting because um, they have normal suppletive forms for core cases, but all uh, locative cases are formed with the help of a postposition. So basically, you take a postposition and you put possessive, um, uh, you attach possessive affixes to it, and these are the uh, locative forms like to me, from me, and so on. Adjectives have almost zero inflection morphology. And then uh, all these languages have, uh, have affixes, so called emphatic, connected to focus, or to insistence, or like delimitative, and exclamative affixes which can attach anywhere, basically, to nouns, verbs, pronouns. Uh, adverbs, numerals, whatever you want. They usually would go after duration and before inflection. Um, so there is this stuff of, there are not many of them, like four or five affixes belonging to the category that we call emphatic. 
and the same four or five exclamative affixes that would not, they would not make difference between parts of speech. And here have some examples from Enet. This is um, an example showing you one of these transcategorial affixes, which we call insist, uh, and in Russian it's usually will, will be translated with daje. Uh, so he doesn't say even a single word, and then this in this um, affix will be attached to um, numeral here. And this is the same. Um, this is a tundra Enet example. This is a forest Enet example. This is basically the same affix. The phonology of the affix is a bit different uh, because it's a different dialect. Um, they even cannot speak, and here it will be attached to a verb, and it will go before the marker for con verb. Um, okay, now a couple of words about syntax. Syntax. Um, this are left branching language. Languages, meaning S would be in a, in a clause, or like if you take a noun phrase, then the, you'll have first um, modifiers and then a noun at the end. This is not very strict in finite clauses, even though it would be the most frequent word order, and it's strict in non finite clauses. So if you have a relative clause, a complement clause, and a verbal clause, it will always have a verb at the end, and it will be inserted in the right place in the main clause. So if it is a relative clause, it will immediately precede the head noun. If it's a complement clause, it will immediately precede the matrix verb. If it's an adverbial clause, well, it can be anywhere, but it will, within itself, it will have, it will be verb final always. There is no agreement in case between a head noun and a modifying noun phrase. And there is a nice variation in agreement in number in a noun phrase, so this agreement in number is completely absent in it. It's optional in Tundra and it's obligatory in Ghanasan. Mm. Then, uh, also a nice feature on the discourse level of all these languages is that possessive affixes are used for discourse purposes. So you would use second person possessive, third person possessive for reference tracking, like this one we have mentioned. For this, you would use you would attach possessive affix, uh, or if you want to emphasize something. And uh, there has not been specific studies how different is the system in different clauses made languages, but it definitely exists in all of them. Then these languages use postpositions and non prepositions. And then a nice feature of all these languages are agreeing adverbs. This is an example from Tulbrenianets. We opened the box with difficulty. And so you have the, this adverb with difficulty and it will agree with the subject. These adverbs always agree with the subject and there are a few of them. So most adverbs are non-agreeing, but each language will have about a dozen, a bit more, a bit less uh, of these agreeing adverbs, which will always agree with the subject. Okay, and my last slide about um, syntax and about structures of this language. It's clause combining. So it's quite typical Siberian clause combining, the same as in all, all, all type languages. We have an example for, of a complement clause, of a relative clause, of an adverbal clause. The first example comes from forest annex. We want to eat. So you have a matrix verb and you have a non finite verb, nominalization in this case with dative because the verb to want um, would require dative. And this is an example from Tundrin Annex. Go to where you lived before. Is a relative clause, go to the place and uh, before leave, and then this is the effective um, anterior participle. And then I'm going to have an example of an adverbal um, clause when the mouse is going out, all of them started to eat. So you have the main clause verb, they started to eat, the subject of the main clause. And here you would have um, uh, the dependent clause when or while the mouse is going out, and it's, this is a non finite verb uh, in a specific case. So it's, it's a combination of this um, nominalization or participle with relative or dative, which gives you this simultaneous reading. And this is, this is a Ganasan example, but this is exactly the cognate. Uh, participle and the cognate case form is used in Enets. 
And then you see here that the subject of the dependent clause can be genitive. It can also be in nominative in other cases, so both are possible, and in one and two we didn't have it explicit the subject of the dependent clause. Okay, uh, and now I have, uh, I can say briefly, a couple of interesting things about the um, uh, about the structures, but about Moses may add a linguistic family. So there are three issues, but maybe I will skip the last one and stop, discuss only the first two, just because I don't have enough time. Um, so Northern Medic as a family, um, I will discuss whether Rungana-san is really part of this family or, or not, and what is the place of Makaor in, uh, in um, relation to Northern Medic, which is another uh, Samoyedic language. And then I'll say a couple of words about the internal structure of Northern Samoyedic. Is it a branch in the linguistic family? Or is it a result of a dialect continuum? So first, what is the Gnosis Mayeri as a family? So this was a classic picture uh, till the end of the 1990s. So Jan Hanin in his uh, earlier works, these are kind of the main people for Protestant Mayeric reconstruction. Uh, and all of them agree that you have the non-Osmatic family in these Nenets and it's in Kanasan, and then you have all the other Osmatic languages. It's not entirely clear how they group, but non Semitic group together. But they would still put Mato somewhere near Ganasan. But then, in 1998, Yuki Yankinen suggested quite a different tree. Where he suggested that Ganasan was the first one to split from proto semitic and then you have all the other Semitic languages. And then you would have these northern Semitic languages, and then the southern Semitic languages. And then Mator would be again entirely different. So, and uh, because this was the latest publication, now it is reproduced in most work which are connected to Uralic studies or to typological studies, as if Nganasan is not a Muslim Semitic language. So, in particular, it's um, repeated in Glotalog. And basically, if you compare these two pictures, mm, this one and this one, the main difference is. What is the relation between the Anets and Zangata, between Anets and Garasan? Do they belong to the same range, or are they just um, near each other in geographic space, but different historically? If I show you this map to remind you where is Garasan and where is Tumba Anet, so they're really near each other in geographic space, but what is the relationship between them? Is there similarity due to contact? Basically, the Yankinans, the 1998 Yankinans idea was, yes, Nganasan looks a lot like Enets or like other Northern Semitic languages, but this is a result of contact between Tundra Enets and Nganasan, not the result of common inheritance. And quite recently, um, Valentin Wissett has tried to show that the shared vocabulary between Tundra Enets and Nganasan and the structural features are very numerous. For example, you've just seen the case system, it's identical. The nominal, the, this uh, system of nominal stems and verbal stems is identical. And then, very recently, we have checked the uh, true loan words between Tundra Enets and Ganasan. So these words for which you can show that they are not commonly inherited from Protestant Protonotosmanetic, but there are, there are ways to understand that it was borrowed either from Ganasan into Tundra Enets or from Tundra Enets into Ganasan. And there are very few such words. They're all connected to nature, like the sea, or some, some fishes, some trees, or to culture, like some civilization items. There are a couple of discourse words, but they're very few. So basically, when Yantin suggested that the similarity between Ganasan and Tundra Enes are due to contact, then the picture is very strange because you have massive uh, uh, massive um, borrowings in linguistic structure and basically no borrowings in vocabulary, which we have seen in Amazonia, but this is not really the case for this area. People speak, the um, Ganasans have been speaking Tundra Enets for at least 300 centuries and the other way around, so this, these people are not lingual, they can borrow and it would be very strange. So basically, taking together these two facts, the structural similarity and the, uh, the absence of true long words, we think that's really the common inheritance is the answer, not um, 
the not the the, the contact inference. And then same important thing also uh, okay the gamma sun is a part of the semantic family, but what about monopoly? Uh, if uh, we check not to be it was again Valentin Gusev who has checked it. Uh, he has looked at the 100 word lists and the percentage of cognate words. And if you look at Tundra Enets, then the biggest number of cognates will be missing Ganasan, definitely. But then the next Samoyedic language will be Matok, not Tundra Enets, who is just next door and who has structurally very, very similar. But this basic 100 Swadesh word list would show you more percentage of cognate words with Mato than with other Somalian languages. And if you take Mato words, 100 word, word list, and compare it to all other Somalian languages, then the biggest number of cognates would be with Enets. Um, so the Enets, the Tundra Enets and Mato are in lexically at least are closer to each other than, than any other Muslim Somalian language. And then the important part of the story is that Nana san has many words without known etymology. Um, I'm afraid to give the exact number, but it's maybe something like 20 or 30 percent of words in Nana san. No, too much? No? <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I remember from, from, from Valentin Gusev words. That there are just many words for which we see no cognate in other Semitic languages. And so the basic idea, and this is the idea which is supported by archaeological facts and by the legends, the Ganasan legends, that there was some pre ganasan population earlier on Timur, and then the northern Somali people arrived from the Sayans, from the Sayan mountains in the south, and it's more or less widely accepted that, that the Somali people arrived from the south. Uh, and basically they assimilated this earlier Cameroon population, and the most northeastern from these northern Semitic languages were Tundra Enets. So that's why the Tundra Enets kind of were the first ones uh, who contacted this pre Samoyede population of Timur, uh, and that's why the Ganasan is so similar to Tundra Enets and not to other languages. And basically, in Ganasan and its structure, it's mostly northern Semitic, it's very similar to Tundra Enets. Um, so it's not really a mixed language, but there are some phrases like this word without known etymology, uh, which show that there was something else, some substrate. And the most probably this um, Mato, the connection between Matar and Tundra ends. Matar is an extinct Samoyedic language which was spoken in the Siam Mountains and near the Siam Mountains. That before this northern Samoyedic people. Uh, left the Saya Mountains, geographically the Tundra and its people were just near these Matar speakers. Uh, but again, for Matar it's an extinct language, it's mainly the word list we have, and that's why we compare lexicon, but don't know much about the structures of Matar. Um, okay, um, maybe two, okay, the last thing. Uh, is about the internal composition of northern Semitic languages. These are the northern Semitic languages, Nyanet, Anet, and Ganasan, with their dialects. So it's not only Anet that has forest Anet and Tundra Nyanets. As I mentioned, also Nyanet has forest Anet and Tundra Nyanet. And there is this Yura, which is in between Nyanet and Anet. And actually, Tundra Nyanet has several dialects, and forest Nyanet has several dialects. And uh, an interesting thing, and Ganasan also has two dialects. An interesting thing is uh, kind of how well here we put it as branches. So first in Ganasan, Nenets and Nenets, and then Nenets is divided in two, Nenets is divided in two. Is it truly like this? So it was first Helen Skew who suggested that northern Semitic languages are as a result of a dialect continuum, slowly diverging with some parts of the continuum still in contact, some not, then any, any abrupt split. And then um, uh, a year ago, Valentin Rusev has nicely shown uh, that there are some phonetic isoglosses that divide this continuum differently. So you cannot just take this picture and then two phonetic isoglosses like some protosomyetic vowels, consonants, consonant clusters, and what has happened to them. And sometimes you will see 
um, the change which happened to like forest edits and forest nanites, to the things which are not adjacent on this picture. And then it does not mean that you can just redraw the picture because then there would be another phonetic Isaac loss that you would combine forest edits and your edits in Ghanasan. And basically what it means is that when we consider the internal migrations of these people that I mm, commented on yesterday, that 300 years ago, they, even 300 years ago, for which we know, they were kind of located differently in relation to each other, and then some of them moved north, and so some, those who were in between, kind of, they, there was an empty space, and those who were not adjacent uh, um, became adjacent. So this is really a very nice, the case how, how if we know these migrations we can understand better how the how you know, historically these languages form. Okay, I skip the, this piece and I go to the conclusion, which is that the northern Semitic languages are quite well described today, and um, not only they are well described now, but also there is some people working on the protosemetic reconstructions, so we have good descriptions, we have some alien reconstructions, which are also quite good. And these languages are quite uniform if you compare it to kind of other linguistic families all over the world. Uh, they are quite similar. Uh, and that's why it's even more interesting to study them, to study the divergent patterns. So, okay, they are so similar in many things, but here they are different, here they are different. And what are the possible explanations for that, for these differences? Um, and also the fact that most of these like, Semitic like northern Semitic languages have dialects also help us in, in this in the study of the divergent patterns. And uh, for exactly these languages, linguistic geography and reconstruction of sociolinguistic patterns of the past can be very useful because this was a change in picture. If we know it, we understand better why these languages are similar here but are divergent there. Okay, that was all. Thank you. Say a little time. Uh, I wonder, uh, can uh, the cases be expressed without the possessives, uh, if any? Yes, they can. Yes, you can say to the house, you can say from the house. Okay, thank you very much.